Now comes an example showing how important reference dependence is and how catastrophic it can be if one is not aware of reference dependence. This example will be the famous Rabin paradox, maybe I should say rumors paradox, because when it was published there were many vivid and confused di discussions of it. Anyway, a few decades before, Paul Samuelson had published a somewhat similar paradox, but Rabin's paradox is quite stronger. It makes weaker, more convincing assumptions, then it derives stronger, more absurd implications. So I present his paradox. It starts with this preference that I display here. 50-50 lottery plus 11 minus 10. People are asked, do you accept or decline it? The majority of people decline it. This happens for many people, also at may all, or at least a wide range of belt levels. So at many belt levels you find this. Well, I want to do a within single agent analysis. So I'm going to assume that we consider one representative average agent. And we're going to assume at the level of wealth where the agent is, the agent is declining the lottery. But we also assume that if we change the wealth level, if we add uh, amount M to the bank account or sub subtract something, the agent will continue to have that preference. And that's plausible because at every wealth level, we find it as a majority preference. Therefore, from now on, we assume one uh, representative agent declining this lottery at many, maybe all wealth levels. In the analysis that follows, I will ignore probability weighting, so I will assume that the W function is linear, so to say. One reason is for simplicity. I want to focus on the novelty, the reference dependence, new deviation from the classical model that we haven't discussed yet. So we'll keep things simple. But it's also empirically realistic. There have been detailed experimental investigations of the Rabin paradox, what is happening there, finding that probability weighting is not really playing a role here, empirically speaking. So it's also empirically realistic that we can ignore it. So that we do. Now, I'm going to analyze it first using reference dependence, then nothing special will happen, just nothing. But then after, I will analyze it using reference independent models, and then absurd, weird things will happen, big catastrophes will happen, so then it will be spectacular, so to say. First come the reference dependent analysis. Well, I didn't explain reference dependence models yet, so let me put up an inequality and then explain what is happening. So no probability weighting, right? So we assume expected utility inequality here, but in reference dependence, we assume that the utility function and then the expected utility functional can depend on the wealth level. That dependence is expressed by that subscript, a small m. Now, maybe you're getting worried. You think, wait a minute, if for every real number, every wealth number, we have a different expected model, that's way too much, way too complex uh, to measure and do things with. And you're right. So, of course, we must add specifications, special assumptions. And for instance, one assumption often made is that if small m doesn't change very much, maybe the utility function doesn't change at all, as often assumed, and it works often well as a good approximation in applications. But let's not get too much into detail. Let's just go on and analyze using this reference dependence model. And we see from the inequality that the utility unit zero is above the midpoint of these two. So zero is closer to the in utility units, it's closer to eleven and two minus ten. That's how I rewrote the inequality here. So we have that inequality. Now this is really easy to accommodate. The only thing we have to do is take that utility function with subscript m and let it be a bit concave in a neighborhood of zero. For instance, a bit of loss aversion already does it. Uh, maybe you know that loss aversion is simply being a lot of concavity at zero. So it's easy to find a utility function that satisfies that. And in fact, we can take one utility function that does it, have it independent of the subscript M. So that generality problem that I mentioned a moment ago that doesn't happen, but still we can easily accommodate it. I should say there are all kinds of difficulties and also in modeling with reference dependence models. So uh, they will come, we will discuss them later. But for now, let's keep things simple. But anyway, these Rabin preferences, they are absolutely not a problem for the reference dependent model. We can easily accommodate them. So life is good and we're happy, nothing special happening. But now I go and present a classical analysis and then horrible things will happen. So first I put up the preference. This is the preference we have. And we start with, uh, you know, no probability weighting. So I put up the expected utility inequality. In the classical analysis, you will say, uh, this is implied, this inequality. Okay, but remember, we have it not only at the reference level where the agent is right now, we have it at many reference levels. So if we add a small amount uh, M, or maybe it's a big amount M can also be, we add that to the bank account, that will not change the preference. So we have to also incorporate that. 
Now a classical uh, uh, analyst will say, wait, if you add a, a small m to the bank account, then all these things are taking place at the higher wealth level. So I have to uh, incorporate that. And this is how a classical analyst will probably write it. He will say, now all these money amounts have increased by small m. So that is how we should write. Here I did it. This agent is small m richer than it was before. So now this inequality captures the preference of the agent. Well, if you see this, probably you think no big deal. Before we wrote it as subscript, now we write it in the argument of the function, just a small shift in notation, nothing big happening. But you're wrong, here something big is happening. What we have now is really, it cannot be. This will lead to absurdities and horrible complications, catastrophes. And I will show you. First, I rewrite the inequality as we did before. In utility units, small m is closer to m plus 11 than to m minus 10. That's how I wrote here. And I'm going to do some algebraic manipulation with that inequality. First, I repeat it here on the first line, and then a bit of algebra coming, and then the conclusions. I divide both by 11, can do. I rewrite the right fraction a bit. I take out the factor 10 over 11. So the denominator now is 10 and not 11. So this is just rewriting. Now, I'm going to look a bit at this fraction and I'm going to bring in one more assumption that I had not told yet, and that is I'm going to assume that the utility function is concave. And that's a reasonable assumption. It's a majority finding the representative agent concave utility we all accept it. With that in mind, I look more at this fraction and I see what this is. This is the, uh, the increase, the average increase of utility over the interval from small m to small m plus 11. In other words, it is the average derivative of utility over that interval. Now I put up an inequality using concavity. I'm getting an inequality here because here I take the derivative at the right end point of the interval. But uh, in a, for concave utility, the bigger the input of the function, the smaller the derivative. So this derivative is smaller than all the derivatives at all the other points in the interval. So it's really smaller than the average derivative over that interval. So this inequality I get here. Now I turn to something similar here on the right hand side. I'm going to look only at the fraction, ignore the 10 over 11 for a moment. This fraction here is the average derivative of utility over the interval m minus 10 up to m. And because of concavity, I can write what I do here. Here I take the left end point of that interval from m minus 10 to m. And there the utility, the derivative, is at least as big as it is at all the points in the interval. So it's surely at least as big as the average derivative. So I get that inequality. Now I put these things together using transitivity of inequality. And what follows is that the derivative at m plus 11 is less than 10 over 11 times the derivative at m minus 10. So that I have. And in words, if I, this is holding for many of a wide range of uh, wealth levels m. And that means then, if I increase the wealth of the agent by 21, then the derivative, the margin utility, drops by a factor like 10%. It's dropping more than 10 over 11. So that's quite something. And if you think a bit, I just give you 21 euro more. Is already that the, the extra happiness that you get from an extra euro, that is 10% less than it was before? No, your life doesn't change so much from just getting 21 more. To further convince you, I can do the reduction ad absurdum technique. Imagine we don't increase the wealth by 21, but we do it 100 times. We increase the wealth by 2100. Then the derivative has dropped by a factor 10 over 11 to the power 100. That is less than 1 over 100,000, as I write there. So apparently, in this situation, if I add 2100 euro to your bank account, then you say, now one extra euro, how much extra happiness I get from it, is less than one of a hundred of thousand times what it was before. This is complete, so it almost completely vanishes, just from 2100 euro more on your bank account. That doesn't make sense, that's not reasonable. So uh, this, you find this absurd, although this is a sort of introspective argument, and economists quite like to express things in observable preference, not just introspection, but we can do that also, and we can also get absurdities. For instance, one implication, if the derivative is dropping as far as fast as it does here, the function quickly becomes very flat, and the function is bounded above. 
And it can be seen that if you look how much in utility units, minus 100 is below zero, you can see that there will be no positive amount that can be so far above zero. So in absolute value, never the utility of positive money amounts reaches the level of absolute value that utility at minus 100 has. That can be proved, you take my word for it. But that implies that if I offer a gamble to this agent, I say 50-50, either you pay me 100 or I give you capital M, and capital M can be an absurd 20 billion, always the agent will decline. And that's also absurd, I think. You know, everybody will and should accept such an offer if capital M is 20 billion. I think everybody, every listener would do that without any hesitation. Now, this is just completely absurd. And this is, uh, this cannot be. This is a paradox. Uh, this cannot be. So, therefore, let me uh, repeat the line of reasoning that I presented to you with the Raven paradox. I started from reasonable empirical assumptions, then I analyzed it using classical expected utility, also assuming concave utility, then I got totally absurd implications that everybody agrees this is nonsense, this cannot be. Well, I think the empirical assumptions were reasonable, concavity of utility is also reasonable, the only thing that can be wrong is this expected utility model in a classical reference independent manner. That model cannot be right, it cannot work well empirically, we we'll have to give it up. So that's the conclusion that we draw from the Rabin paradox. Also, Rabin in the conclusion immediately below what he said, I think that loss aversion is the most plausible assumption and loss aversion incorporates reference dependence. So he immediately gave the right hint for what must be going on here. And that's indeed the lesson we have to learn from it. You may be a bit surprised that this, this paradox had so much impact because it was the year 2000, you know, it was quite long after the Allais paradox, for instance. We already had all kind of non-expected utility models like prospect theory. It was already well known that there are many empirical violations. So why this, this, uh, was it so upsetting to many people? And it may be that this paradox, it quite goes at the heart of expected utility. In expected utility, the utility function is a tool with which you can do everything. This function, this paradox shows that that tool gives absurdities. It doesn't work well. Also, what is really going on in this paradox is reference dependence. And that's quite like in the LA paradox, probability weighting can do it. Reference dependence is more subtle than probability weighting. And one of the big problems when there were these confused debates about this paradox is many people did not understand how fundamental a breakaway from the classical model it is if you assume reference dependence. Many people thought, oh, reference dependence, I just like the classical model, nothing much is happening. But yes, it is a very fundamental big breakaway, and I hope that this example helped to show you. So we have to incorporate reference dependence into our model. That is what prospect theory will do. That is something that will come in following recordings.